You guys want to know a secret? Come here. Let me whisper it in your ear. The, uh, the Sega Dreamcast didn't sell very well. Shocking, I know. Since this is a topic that no one has ever spoken about on the internet before, I think I'll go into the history, but considering I'm being completely sarcastic right now, I'll try to keep it brief. So, in conclusion, the reason for the Dreamcast failure laid almost entirely in, in urine and feces. The Dreamcast launched in 1998 in Japan, 1999 in the rest of the world. And even though Sega's previous console, the Saturn, was a gigantic mega flop, the Dreamcast's launch actually went really well. Too well. Even though Sony controlled a significant portion of the console market, Sega were optimistic about the console's future. But then, boom. March 1999, before the Dreamcast even launched in America, Sony announced the PlayStation 2. Uh-oh. If Sega was to have any chance of not being decimated by the colossal threat of the PlayStation, brand, they were going to have to get everyone they could to buy a Dreamcast, so they were going to need to appeal to as many demographics as possible. Sega looked at the Dreamcast library and saw that they had all these games with dude protagonists for hardcore boys and radical boys and whatever the target demographic for Choo Choo Rocket was. Not sure on that one. But as with most consoles of the day, there was a big lack of games with female protagonists and games aimed at a female demographic during this time. Sega wanted to attract this audience as well, so they tasked Tetsuya Mizuguchi, a game designer from their United Game Artists subsidiary with creating a game that had a broad enough appeal to be enjoyed by everyone, but with a special focus on female casual gamers. Mizuguchi wasn't aware such a thing existed. Mizuguchi was at a loss. He probably didn't even know what a woman was, let alone that they played video games. So if he were to make a game that appealed to this new species, he was going to need to interview a few of them. These interviews gave him the answer he was looking for. The women he interviewed tended to enjoy puzzle games, while the men tended to have a desire to accomplish things. In his words, be the champion. The thrill of the conquest. Mizuguchi was a big music fan, having been obsessed with MTV during its early years, with Cyndi Lauper, XTC, and Duran Duran being some artists he was particularly interested in around this time. During his time at university, Mizuguchi studied media aesthetics and ended up screwing around on a Sony Betamax editor with the video for the song Paranoimia by Art of Noise. Mizuguchi also took inspiration from a variety of other sources, including his time spent at disco nightclubs and events like Street Parade, which is an annual techno parade in Zurich, Switzerland. I, I gotta say, I had no idea techno parades were a thing, and I'm a big fan of the fact that this dude was just going to them in Switzerland. My man gets around. And naturally, being a big music fan who went to college for media aesthetics, he took a lot of inspiration from things like 50s and 60s music, particularly psychedelia, as well as some of the music videos he watched during his teenage years, specifically citing the 80s output of Michael Jackson and Peter Gabriel as influences. While the game Mizuguchi was tasked with making, Space Channel 5, began development as a rhythm game, its earlier iterations weren't exactly as memorable and unique as the final product would become. While the stylish FMVs that were shown during gameplay, the ones that the game would become known for, were present in accounted for, even at an early stage, the actual gameplay was more similar to other rhythm games of the time. Press buttons in time with the music. Riveting. This gameplay concept isn't bad on its own, I guess, but most other rhythm games have something to make them stand out. In the case of stuff like Dance Dance Revolution and Guitar Hero, it's funky controllers that take up a lot of space in your house and only really have one purpose, so eventually, after you go through your phase where you're really into that particular game for a while, you come to the difficult decision that you need to downsize. So you donate it to the Goodwill, where it sits alongside the mountain of other fake plastic guitars and old PS2 discs. But then, years later, you get nostalgic and you want to get back into your old habit. Except you can't find any guitars at Goodwill anymore, so you go to eBay, only to find that just enough time has passed for these giant old pieces of shit to be considered retro. So now, you're stuck having to pay $40 instead of 4 to relive a point in your life- Oh shit, wait, I've still got like 40 minutes of Space Channel 5 stuff to talk about. Where was I? Oh yeah, so the game was boring. Yawn! It was like every other rhythm game. You just put buttons while a video played in the background. Inspiration struck when Mizuguchi saw the percussion group. Stomp. Percussion group. I love this guy. They had this bit where they would clap and then the audience would clap back and the rhythm would get more intense as time went on. I, I, I suppose the percussion group equivalent of when you're at a rock concert and the vocalist goes and then the whole audience has to go and then he's like 
and then you just, you, you, you get the point. This made it obvious to Mizuguchi which direction to move in. The villains of the game would do a particular rhythmic pattern with particular directions and button commands, and then the player would mimic it afterwards. He came into the studio and he was like, hey, team, this is my idea, what do you think? And his team was like, what? They didn't understand. They couldn't see his vision. So he hired a goddamn pantomime to teach them physical comedy. I'm not kidding. In his own words. So we had a workshop at UGA studio, and the pantomime would always talk about, how can we make fun? He'd say, imagine there's a glass door here. Run through it, break it, make a pose, and say one word. Can you make people laugh? So everybody was watching, as you had to do it by yourself, alone. Everybody was shy. At first, nobody could do it. But even if you said oneup.com, made a funny pose, and stood there for 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 6 seconds, everyone would start to make small laughs. But once you wait 8 seconds, 10 seconds, everyone would start laughing out loud. We knew there was a mechanism behind why people laugh. There were reasons for everything. It was a great atmosphere. There's a pressure and release. It's a very physical and mental mixture. Eventually, it got to the point where we'd all go out to the bar and someone would say, hey, give me a beer, and then hold a pose for like 10 seconds. It was so fun. Not entirely sure how this helped with articulating his initial idea, but you gotta respect it. This man made his team learn comedy in the name of game design. Something tells me Mizuguchi could have been a theater kid. Just me? So, the game plays down, we got the style, but what about the story? Enter Ulala. Ulala is a 22 year old reporter who works for the TV station Channel 5, which we can safely assume is broadcast in space. In the year 2499, clearly the streaming bubble has burst at this point in the future and we're back to watching TV. Although, Channel 5's ratings have apparently been badly on the decline for years, so who's to say? Anyways, Ulala has been with Channel 5 for two years as of the time of the game's events, and the station's director, Fuse, has left it up to her to save the network. Things start to heat up when a group of aliens called Marolians invade Spaceport 9, a place on Earth where spaceships dock, and start forcing people to dance. It's up to Ulala to not only report on this event, but also to defeat the aliens and rescue the victims who have been trapped in a state of perpetual groove. How does she do that? Well, while a lot of people put into this same position would solve their problems with violence, Ulala chooses to take the pacifist route and solve her problems with the art of dance. Ulala, no! Ulala carries two guns that are called tension blasters. One of them, which is triggered with the A button, is used to defeat aliens, while the other, triggered with the B button, is used to save hostages from the aliens. This adds a little more strategy to the game, because unlike later installments, the same voice command is used regardless of which gun you need to fire, which means that you have to pay a little more attention to the gorgeous visuals. More on that later. Anyways, Ulala keeps having to dance and fight her her way through various enemies, including a variety of alien robots, a rival reporter from Channel 42 named Pudding, and the space pirate Jaguar. The further she goes on, the more she learns about why the aliens are attacking. Ulala was effectively created by Takashi Yuda, a Sega employee who also worked on the Genesis Sonic games, as well as the first two Sonic Riders games, among other titles. Ulala's character design is immediately eye-catching and iconic. Her outfit is bright orange with some blue and white highlights, which complements the branding of the Dreamcast nicely, and the pink hair definitely helps. I tried to find some information on how they designed her, and uh, ooh boy. I found this interview with Mizuguchi from a volume of the official Dreamcast magazine, and the interviewer seems very interested in a specific aspect of Ulala's design. With Ooh La La, are you targeting the game at an older audience? Did you make her sexy on purpose? Yes, we thought about it. You can definitely see up Ulala's panties when her skirt flies up, but it's not so obvious. Her sex appeal is very subtle. I believe the way she moves is really important. Ulala looks very real and sexy. She moves passionately, which makes her sexy. We worked on it a lot, because we only used a low number of polygons to make Ulala. I think her sex appeal comes from the way she moves. I believe that it's more difficult to design things like this that you can't see. Now we don't have time to unpack all of that. <laughs> Obvious thirstiness aside, I actually really like one thing that he says there. Because this is a rhythm game, Ulala's movement is a very important part of her character. A lot of the dancing animations she does are immediately distinctive and full of personality. Doubly important because, as Mizuguchi said, the model itself is really low poly. So focusing on creating movement that's detailed, energetic, alive, almost feeling realistic, really helps to sell the aesthetic of the game. Uh, I mean, it's also a good way of getting those thirsty, thirsty gamers to drop their $50 bills on this game without resorting to more, uh, 
Shameless tactics. Then again, Mizuguchi also justifies the panty shots featured in the game with a small piece of lore, basically saying, hey, it's 500 years in the future. Exposing your underwear on the news doesn't even matter anymore, which honestly, good for him. I would love to have so little on my plate that I could think about how changing social standards will eventually affect how women's underwear will be perceived in public. I, I kind of love this man. Ulala's design also reflects how Mizuguchi was trying to design a game that would be appealing to everyone. He said that he found that male and female gamers tended to view female characters differently. Oh, no. All right, Mizuguchi, enlighten me. How do men and women view female video game characters differently? Apparently, he found that women are more interested in a female character's personality, while men tended to favor that character's looks. Of course, I don't know what I was expecting. Basically, he says that women like female characters that they thought filled the same role as actual people, like a good friend or a big sister, whereas men didn't really care about what was going on under the surface as long as the character was cute or sexy. Just like in real life. That was sarcastic. Please don't flame my video and tell me about how you're different, how you're one of the good ones. I believe you. Anyways, these two things have the potential to conflict a bit. So how did you solve this great contradiction? Oh, master of games. Hey, I, I think I'll just read the snippet from the interview verbatim. On the other hand, Mizuguchi also found that women didn't like seeing characters that were too appealing to men, since it often created feelings of rivalry or jealousy. Keeping those points in mind, Mizuguchi had Ulala's CG model redrawn a number of times to make sure she didn't look too seductive and gave her a somewhat male-like casual and carefree personality. For example, she didn't care if her underpants showed a bit while she danced. What the fuck? <laughs> Okay, I'll be brief because I think I've been on this subject for a while now, but I feel like there are maybe reasons why women might not enjoy seeing characters that are too appealing to men other than being jealous of them, but that's just me. And the fact that the best example they could give of Ulala having a carefree personality, which she does have, was the fact that she doesn't care if her underwear show. I thought showing your underwear on the news wasn't a big deal in 2011-12, Tetsuya. Make up your mind! Also, I love the idea of Mizuguchi breathing down an artist's neck all day, watching their every move, only to occasionally declare that Ulala was too sexy and that they needed to change it. But even despite the uh, questionable intentions of her creators, it's hard to argue that Ulala is a vibrant, distinctive, and downright iconic character that's immediately recognizable, and a large part of that is down to her mannerisms. You can see this in pretty much any given shot of the game. The way that she walks, the way that she dances in place while listening to aliens rattle off button commands, even the way that she poses at the end of each segment. Space Channel 5! This is something that notably gets translated pretty much whenever she appears in a crossover or other game. She dances while playing tennis, she'll turn Stay to face on. the screen when racing. The emphasis of slightly exaggerated over-the-top movement really is an important part of her character. Ulala adds a lot to the game. There's a character with a similar color scheme and outfit used in this early concept footage, but I don't know. That just lacks personality. Charm. Ulala has both of those things in spades. Something that really helps Ulala and the other characters in the charm and personality department is the voice acting. The Japanese version mostly uses members of the development team as voices, with Takashi Yuda, the game's director and creator of Ulala, notably playing the character Fuse. Ulala's voice is credited to Ulala herself in game. Sega kind of wanted to treat Ulala like a Hatsune Miku before Hatsune Miku, a character that could be a celebrity in her own right. But her voice is usually attributed to Minoko Oka Okamura, who was an assistant producer and supervisor on the team. Okamura is also listed as being a member of Team Pheromone, and I have no idea what that means, but I'll take a shot in the dark. According to a Medium interview with Tetsuya Mizuguchi from 2015, the team was often split up into smaller divisions, and some people on the team study about pheromones and what makes the main character so attractive. How can we make the gamers think she's really sexy? So maybe she was part of the team tasked with giving Ulala the ability to reel in thirsty gamer boys. Glad we get to re-enter that subject matter. Really fun thing to discuss. God, this video is gonna get flamed so hard. I think my subscribers are gonna be okay about it. I think they'll be fine. Maybe, I don't know. Lots of boomers in my audience. Lots of grillers. When it came to the English voice of Ulala though, they had to enlist some outside help. Apollo Smile, a singer, dancer, stunt double, and host of the Anime Week block on the Sci-Fi channel, notably 
styling herself as the live action anime girl, was brought in to do the voice of Ulala in the English version of the game. It sounds like they went through a lot of auditions before landing on her, with Mizuguchi himself being involved in the process, and I have to say, she does an amazing job. She has a lot of energy and gives Ulala a really distinct and fun personality. Stay tuned! I think her experience as a host for the Anime Week programming block comes through because she's a natural fit as a space reporter. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Channel's Anime Film Festival. Groovy. I love all the other voices in the game too, from Jeff Kramer's intentionally overdramatic and corny take on Jaguar. You're not bad at all. I will see you later. To David Nowlin's animated, raspy voice for Fuse. Man, that ain't just good, that is perfect. All of the voice acting in the game is full of character, and it's clear they went all out to ensure that it fit the game's distinctive visuals and music. The localization clearly had a lot of love and care put into it. Localization producer Mari Naomi briefly talked on Twitter about how that team was predominantly female at a time when there weren't a lot of women in the video game industry. Naomi herself wrote the dialogue, directed the voiceovers, and, in her own words, fought to make Ulala's character less sexist. Given everything I know about Mizuguchi-san, I have to thank her. And to match Ulala's bright, eye-catching outfit and over-the-top movement, the rest of the visuals are incredibly colorful and vibrant. You could say really loud visually. This is where Mizuguchi's background and media aesthetics absolutely comes through. You can see a lot of influence from those surrealist 80s music videos, but I caught quite a lot of 60s psychedelia in here as well, particularly towards the end when you fight the final boss. Chief Blank inside of a TV screen. These bright, solid colors are immediately striking, and I absolutely love it. Another strong source of inspiration for Mizuguchi was the work of Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky? I'm pretty confident on the Japanese names, but Russians, I don't know. Kandinsky was commonly credited as the pioneer of abstract art, and notably took influence from the art of music, using musical terms like composition and improvisation to describe his own work. Kandinsky also notably described hearing musical notes and chords as he painted, which sounds a lot like synesthesia. Synesthesia, for those of you who don't know, is a condition in which experiencing something through one of your senses will lead to an automatic, involuntary, and otherwise unrelated experience through another sense. Put simply, if you have synesthesia, you would have an association between one sense and another that most people don't. I'll give an example. The most common type of synesthesia is called chromesthesia, wherein a person perceives color when they hear sound, and this can take different forms for different people, whether that be certain instruments, notes, or musical techniques textures appearing as a certain color. While this is listed as an influence on Space Channel 5, and I can definitely see some inspiration from the vivid expressionist works of Kandinsky, I don't think that Mizuguchi truly achieved his dream of replicating the experience of synesthesia until some of his later works like Res and Tetris Effect. Still, Space Channel 5 is incredibly effective as a rhythm game, and it's still visually stunning to this day, looking like almost no other game. All the characters and many of the backgrounds are vivid and full of character. Speaking of the backgrounds, they're actually pre-rendered videos while the characters in front of them are rendered in real time. This proves to be a double-edged sword in terms of execution. It means that the backgrounds, and cutscenes for that matter, look absolutely fantastic, especially for the time, and honestly, the characters don't look super out of place against them, despite the lower poly count. But I will say that there are a few times where the background changes, like a frame or two before the characters change to accommodate this background shift, meaning that they linger on the screen for a split second, which is minor, but barely distracting distracting at first. Regardless, the game still looks fantastic even despite this minor gripe. As I've touched on earlier, the gameplay is really simple at its core. You want to know how simple it is? Watch. Let's go. To sum that up, an alien will spout off a series of button commands and then, when they finish, you have to copy their button presses and rhythm. Up, down, left, and right require a D-pad press of the appropriate direction. You can't use the analog stick and why would you? Oh my god, the, especially the Dreamcast analog stick? You're disgusting. Sometimes, however, the aliens will say chew. There, there's no chew button on a Dreamcast controller or any controller really. So what's this for? Well, when the aliens say Chew, it means that Ulala will need to use her tension blasters to take a shot. Or, uh, the guns. Those are guns. The player will have to watch the screen carefully, though, because Chew could actually entail an A or B button press, depending upon what's happening on the screen. If Ulala takes aim at an alien, you want to hit A to vaporize them. Mizuguchi said they didn't want to make the game violent, but, uh, that's pretty brutal. But if Ulala's aiming at a hostage, oh my god, Ulala, no, don't, don't do, Ulala, put the gun down, Ulala! Ah! <laughs>
Oh, if you hit the B button, Ulala will actually save the hostage in question with her gun. That's a gun. This ends up leading to something really cool because if you rescue a hostage, they'll actually show up behind you, progressing throughout the level with ooh la la and miming your dance moves as you make them. This means that if you play in really well and rescue all the hostages, you'll soon have a whole party of backup dancers behind you, which can be very satisfying. Depending on who you rescue, you might even get an extra layer added to the music. Like if you rescue this guitar player, the slick mofo will start shredding all over the main theme. Not sure what the hell his animation is though. Come to think of it, the game has a few very fun and clever ways of praising or berating you for good or bad performances. I'll give a few examples. For one thing, I mentioned Space Channel 5's director, Fuse. He's never actually physically seen in the game, but he's still a constant presence. He communicates with Ulala via radio throughout her entire adventure, telling her where to go to continue following the story, and, depending on how she performs through each round of Aliens, will either praise or scold her. He can get pretty mean about it, too. He makes me feel genuinely genuinely bad when I do poorly sometimes. What are you doing? I'm just trying to do my reporting job and the higher ups are getting on my case and I'm dancing as good as I can but the high heels are taking into my feet and I, I just want to go home. <laughs> He's even mean to you if you choose to continue from the game over screen. Like, most games at least reserve the mean line for if you choose to quit, but no, he doesn't care. See you next disaster. I'm trying my best, dude! But his abrasive attitude often means that hearing him happy or excited about how you just danced feels that much sweeter. Especially if you've nailed every button command for the segment, because then he'll sing along to the background music. The first time I heard this, I had the biggest smile on my face. I absolutely love it. So much charm. I did it! Oh, I love that girl. <laughs> Ooh la la will also react to her own performance, and although it's a bit more muted than Fuse, it's nice to hear her get excited when she does a good job. Sometimes Fuse and Ooh la la aren't on the same page though, and this can be pretty funny. I like when Ooh la la is not certain of her own performance, but Fuse thinks she did great. It's like he's encouraging her. It's very wholesome. That was a this is all well and good and cool and epic, but the controls for the game have a tendency of being quite picky and precise with your inputs. I'll get more into that later, though. Speaking of feeling the groove, the background music is actually dynamic based on your performance to some degree. This is, shall we say, unfortunately most notable when you've really shit the bed on a particular segment, because when that segment's over and you've already had to hear Fuse berate you, you get the privilege of listening to this while Ulala la marches onward. Her walk animation even changes. She's really hard on herself for dancing badly. Poor Ulala. Mizuguchi wanted you to know when you were on thin ice, so he punishes you with the same thing that brings the game to life, Ulala's over-the-top movement. In addition to the aesthetic indicators that you're amazing or you suck, there's also a viewership rating in the bottom right corner, and this is important to pay attention to. Each level has a minimum requirement for how low your view rating can be for you to still pass. If you do a good job on one dance segment, your view rating will go up, and if you mess up, it'll go down. Pretty simple, right? Isn't it simple? So simple. <laughs> In addition to that, you'll get some hearts popping up on your HUD during some segments of the game. Each time you mess up, you lose a heart. And if you manage to lose all your hearts during that segment, then the show will be cancelled, you'll get a game over, and you'll have to start the level from the beginning. This can be really frustrating, as these levels are long, and there's a lot of segments to them. You can continue as many times as you want, but you might have to play a lot of the level again. Checkpoints would have saved quite a bit of headache, and there's easy spots for them considering the loading screens between segments, although part of me likes that this punishment is relatively severe because it pushes you to keep improving at the game in the meantime. So, while this is a fun music game, there's a lot you'll need to pay attention to in order to ensure that Ulala can dance her way to victory and not end up out of work because she's not fulfilling the oftentimes unrealistic and extreme demands of her higher-ups. Given that she's lower down on the corporate food chain and doesn't have as much executive power to exert influence, vaguely political rant aside, I've explained to you how it plays, so now I'm going to explain why it plays. Wait, that... that doesn't make any sense. Shit.
Uh, so, Space Channel 5 is a game that heavily relies on you being able to copy rhythms that you've heard, and it's important to tell you, it's very strict. If you're even a goddamn millisecond off that beat, the game won't register your button press, and if you miss even one button press during one rhythm, that entire rhythm is counted as a failure. Your viewership rating will fall, and the game will make sure to let you know that you're a terrible human being, undeserving of love. Space Channel 5 is stupidly precise, more so than its sequel. This this really frustrated me when I first started playing the game. I was on rhythm. I'm a musician. I'm a, I'm a bassist. I know this shit. Stop laughing. Bassists are important. Why is the game so specific? I'm never going to be able to play this. Dumb, stupid game. Bad, dumb, stupid. So I had to do a Google. Space Channel 5 was so hard that I had to look up pro strats to play it. No, no, no. I promise. It's easy. Just, you look so scared. Look into my eyes. Listen to me. Do you want to know what the pro strat is? The extra step that makes the game easier? Are you sure? Okay, so here at Johnny's Tutorial Corner, I'm gonna show you how to do this wicked cheat to make Space Channel 5 easy. You ready? Okay. So, boot up Space Channel 5 as normal. Go play the game. The game will start. What do you do? Get a notepad and write this down. The alien will perform a rhythm, and then the game will pass it off to you, and uh, tap your foot to keep time as you perform the rhythm. Literally. I don't know if the reason why is just because it genuinely helps me keep track of the rhythms, but when I do a straight 4-4 four, four beat with my foot, I play so much better and it's infinitely less frustrating. 4-4 four, four is just when you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. I mean, not necessarily. I mean, I'm just, I'm sim I'm keeping it simple. I'm keeping it simple for the non-musicians in the crowd. Others online echo the sentiment, of course, because I found the tip online. That's how it works. I didn't come up with it. I, I don't have rocket brain. Who the fuck is rocket brain? What's rocket brain? This is what happens when I let myself improv. So yeah, keep uh, tapping your toes when you play. It could be the difference between life and still life, but you have to play a little part of Space Channel 5 again before continuing. This was a pretty interesting thing to come to terms with. Before I ended up looking to the internet for help, I got pretty frustrated during my first few times trying to tackle this game. Even after switching to a CRT to take out any possible input lag, I was still seemingly dropping half my inputs. When I saw one guide say that a good way of making sure that you're staying on rhythm was to tap your foot along to the beat, I laughed. I laughed at this absurd notion until I tried it and started performing infinitely better. Space Channel 5 really does force you to feel the groove at all times if you want to succeed, for better or for worse. Fuse definitely knows. Here they come. Watch your footy. Okay. Unfortunately, it can be a little tiring at higher tempos, so you're going to need to pace yourself. Do leg exercises. Do cardio. Exorcise. So the core gameplay is dead simple. Can be a bit difficult to get a handle on, but if you remember to keep time, you should start off the game doing totally fine. And yet, the way they escalate it manages to keep that simple and addictive gameplay interesting for the entire duration of the game, which, to be fair, you could probably beat in an hour and a half if you play in one sitting and you don't completely suck like me. The game starts you off with simple rhythms, mostly straight quarter notes if my music friends are keeping track, but as the game goes on, they throw faster and more complex rhythms at you. Not only that, but these rhythms can also have a tendency to go on for longer, and you might get more of them before you can catch a breather with more story sections. There's one particular rhythm right during the last stretch of the game that I've never succeeded at because it's so over the top and ridiculous. Is this a vial? Is this a vial from Mega Man X? Are you not supposed to beat the- It feels like you're not supposed to. So the game ramps up the difficulty appropriately as it goes on, but oh boy, rest assured, it doesn't skimp out on the other aspects. Not by a long shot. The game has a much more compelling story than most rhythm games, which isn't saying much, but it does provide a great incentive to keep going. It's so goofy and it really makes you want to see it through. Uncovering just why these aliens are invading and also trying to propel Channel 5 back to its former glory. I already felt like I wanted to keep going just to see more set pieces, but the stakes present in the story really do sweeten the deal. As I mentioned, the game has bosses and other special opponents, and a lot of them are really compelling, both in terms of rhythm and design. You start off fairly simple with Pudding, Ulala's rival reporter from Channel 42 that I mentioned earlier. She pops up a few times and provides a nice foil to Ulala's character, being a lot more vain and competitive. Apparently, according to the Space Channel 5 lore, she used to be a teen idol before 
before she became a reporter, so she's got the ego that's usually associated with that character archetype. Her blue color scheme also provides a really nice contrast to Ulala's orange and pink. Having a rival reporter raises the stakes a little bit, and it gives Ulala someone to compete against. Her personality makes her easy to want to beat without being too obnoxious. She's just pompous and bratty enough to give you a good incentive, but not so much as to actually bother you too badly. Apparently, she's pretty popular with people as well, given that she's the only Space Channel 5 character other than Ulala to appear in the Sega Superstars crossover titles by Sumo Digital. While we're on the subject of human characters, there's also Jaguar. Not like the animal or the Atari console, he's another human. Confusing, I know, but to be fair, Pudding was also a human and not a sentient dessert. Anyways, Jaguar is another rival reporter, but his dynamic is a bit different because instead of working for another major news station like Pudding does, he works for a pirate broadcasting station and advocates for the spread of truth. He apparently used to work for Channel 5, but seemed to believe something was off about the company and left to start his own thing. Oh, yeah, also, minor spoiler warning here, I'll throw in a timestamp if you really want to skip it. He saved Ulala from a spaceship accident when she was younger, which is shown at the beginning of the game. The rescuer is only really revealed as Jaguar during the last report, however, where Ulala is once again saved by him in a scene that mirrors the opening without explicitly stating it. I think that this makes for a solidly impactful moment during that last report, which is foreshadowed well without hitting you over the head. For as important as the story in this fun little rhythm game is, Jaguar and Pudding add a ton of personality to the game, but I think where the game hits its most climactic is when the Marolians bust out their big stupid robots. The game's separated into four reports, and each report ends with a boss battle. I think these do a good job of ramping up gradually. The first one's Coco Tapioca, this big old pink guy. The boss battle's pretty straightforward in terms of gameplay, being the first one, although it's pretty neat to see these little yellow boys pop out of his mouth. What are they called? Yellow submorons? <laughs> God, I love this game. Where things really pick up, though, is the second boss, Moralina. Okay, so picture this. After a screen transition, you see Jaguar get away, and then suddenly, Ulala sees this freaky thing with tentacles, asks is if it's a marshmallow, marshmallow, and then has to save children from its weird tentacly grasp while these fucking violins play over a dance beat. These fucking violins. You have to alternate between saving kids and popping caps. Luckily, the hostages have a nice little pattern around them to differentiate them from the aliens, which is a godsend for smaller displays. Halfway through a deceptively easy fight, it explodes, but then it rises again, the music Music speeds up and the rhythms get trickier. Then, after another series of rhythms, this happens. What the? Is that a tongue? Ah! Oh, la, la. It's incredibly uh, oh. I don't know why Ulala's dialogue there was so sensual, but we'll go with it. There's kind of a lot of that vaguely sexual dialogue in this game, actually. That's part of the charm, though. Wait, no, not like that. I, I, I meant to say that the charm is just how ridiculous the dialogue is, right? You know what I mean. Shut up. Shut up. But seriously, at the beginning of every report, Ulala does a sign-on for her report show, and all of them are really unique, quirky, idiotic, and charming. Hey there, Space Cats. Ulala here coming at you for Galaxy greetings, boys and girls. Hello, Cosmic Kitties. This is Ula La's report show. Can I can I start calling you guys Cosmic Kitties? Are, are we cool with that being the fan base name? Please, let me have this. Anyways, completely irrelevant tangents aside, the third report's boss is called Marolian Monroe. This game is brilliant. Oh my god. Anyways, Miss Monroe makes really good use of the pre-rendered aesthetic of this game because she appears on this really hypnotic looking TV before bursting out of it. No, I don't like this! I need an adult. That is is so creepy. God damn it, these goddamn aliens provoking my goddamn fears with their goddamn 90s ass coming out of their goddamn TV animation. God damn it. Although, I will say, I really like this boss and, come to think of it, all the other ones aesthetically. The tongue on that last one's a little janky because they couldn't pre-render it. Has to interact with Ulala, but that's my only real negative point. Back on track though, Marolian Monroe also demonstrates another thing that the game does a good job of visually that I want to talk about. Watch how her movement syncs up with the pattern of the button combination she calls out. She's unique in the way that she stretches to correspond to the directions, but there's a lot of examples of the game illustrating those directions to you when it gives you longer rhythms that have more of them, like how Marolians will appear at different parts of the screen. Side note about report number three. At one point, the game directly gives you a warning to turn on your damn light and sit a decent distance from the frigging TV monitor, you degenerate. Sit up straight and eat your vegetables. You 
absolute delinquent. This is most likely a seizure warning because look at this. Or wait, I probably shouldn't be telling you to look too closely at this if it's dangerous. I'm putting up a seizure warning too. I don't want to get sued. Sit a decent distance from your computer, phone, TV, or other devices. Turn a light on. Eat, eat your breakfast. Eat your food. Eat toothbrush. To really go in depth on Report 4, I'd need to go a little deeper into spoilers, and I know most people wouldn't mind if I did, but I can honestly hit most of the points I need to on a more surface level without spoiling much, so I'll go over stuff briefly. There's one segment where Ulala enters a TV, and the aesthetic reaches its logical extreme of all bright, solid colors, and it looks so striking and cool. The rest of Report Number 4 also leans a little harder into the pre-rendered side of things, even pre-rendering some of the characters, including Ulala in some shots, and it looks real nice. They definitely saved the most visually impressive part of the game for last, and also the most insane part. Some of the rhythms here are wild, and it actually eases up a bit towards the end for the sake of guaranteeing that you feel awesome when you beat the final boss, which is appreciated. After you made it through a long and arduous level, it would feel awful to lose right at the climax, so I'm happy they did this. They couldn't resist pulling one last asshole move on you, though. You beat the final boss, and you feel awesome about it, then you get to watch the credits roll and bask in your victory. If you're someone like me, you might get a little tired of watching white names scroll against a black background after a few minutes. Maybe pull out your phone. Don't do that, because after the credits roll, you get one last button command. Now, nothing really bad happens if you miss it, but it, it hurts you on the inside. I knew it was coming my second time through the game, and I hit it, and it felt unexplainably good. Euphoric, even. So, I've been talking at you for approximately an entire Monkey Ball Jr. video already, and somehow I have yet to talk about the music in this music game. So, uh, let me do that. The game's theme song, Mexican Flyer, is actually not an original composition. The song is featured and remixed throughout the title, appearing in a few of the OST's other tracks, and being used as something of a motif. Mexican Flyer was a song by British composer and trumpet player Ken Woodman and featured on his 1966 album That's Nice. The album was actually credited to uh, Ken Woodman and his Piccadilly Brass, which is lovely, quite frankly. Mizuguchi has said that Woodman was apparently really surprised to hear that someone wanted to use his song in a video game over 30 years later. He passed away shortly after Space Channel 5's European release, so Mizuguchi unfortunately never got to meet him, but he did make it long enough to see his song get a bit of a second Life. The song's got a great and punchy feel to it with the horns and percussion, but the bass line's what I can't get enough of. See? I'm a bassist, I told you. They made the right choice of using this as the main motif. It fits the game's retro feel and gives it a very distinct identity. The game also uses a few different variations of it, including an acapella rendition in Report 4 that works amazingly well to cap off the game. I've heard rumors that Sega actually purchased the rights and they now permanently own the song, but I couldn't verify that. The other original music is also fantastic and fits in super well. Though none are quite as memorable as Mexican Flyer, they all keep a great amount of energy and there's a few definite bangers. Report 4 alone goes through so many different moods, including an incredibly tense piece for the boss battle with Evilla. Evilla may or may not be an evil robot version of Ulala. What of it? Lover design. Much like Pudding, she provides a great counterbalance to Ulala's look. Somewhat famously, Michael Jackson shows up towards the end of the game. Developer Jake Kazdal, who worked at Sega's Shibuya office, told some of the story about how this came to be in 2012. So this is a funny story. We were late in development and there was no space Michael. And we were late, like almost beta I want to say. And one day, Suchi yutsumi san who was the head of Sega's development at the time in Japan, who was now the president of Q Entertainment with Tetsuya mizuguchi san came into our office. And he was like, yeah, Michael Jackson. He saw the game and he loves it and he really, really wants to be in it. And we had like a month left. And we were like, what the hell? Let's do it. So we buckled up and we just made it happen. And yeah, it was super awesome. No word why Shuji Utsumi was just hanging out in the US with Michael Jackson, but it gave us a pretty iconic moment, so whatever. Space Channel 5 is pretty short, but luckily, it has a decent amount of replay value because of its extra mode, wherein you can play the four reports of the campaign again, but with some alternate segments containing entirely new set pieces, dialogue, and button combos that make the game a decent bit harder, especially Report 4, which is also incredibly cool visually. The music also becomes much more dramatic, and if you mess up too much, my god is it a cacophony. It hurts. I feel so bad.
Sega had a visually striking, fun, and replayable game on their hands, and they appropriately came out swinging with the marketing for Space Channel 5. It was revealed in September 1999 during the Tokyo Game Show, and man, I really wish that this event was more documented. It looks like it was really fun. Apologies for some of the images being low res, but I've had trouble finding better rips. Anyways, they went all out with the branding here. First of all, Tokyo Game Show staff were decked out in these seemingly stylish Space Channel 5 t-shirts, of which only this image seems to exist. I, uh, I'm kind of mad these never became commercial products. I really like the color schemes. There were also 18 centimeter dolls of the Marolians, as well as a nice big balloon of one riding a rocket. If you look at the video from the event, featuring Tetsuya Mizuguchi himself talking about the game, looking very happy about it, you can also see some banners in the background. And, if you look closely enough, you're also likely to see something else that might catch your eye. Ulala herself turned up to the Tokyo Game Show and numerous other Japanese events, portrayed by Nahoko Nezu, the very same woman who choreographed the game itself. If anyone would be able to match Ulala's movements, it would be her, and it definitely comes through in the footage that we have. Side note, I really like how Mizuguchi is so invested in explaining the game that he's just completely losing in the background. So good. Nezu would go on to portray the character at numerous other in-person events, including a launch party in Tokyo. She was joined by Mizuguchi, as well as then-president of Sega, Suichiro Iramajiri. According to the official Dreamcast magazine, there was a jumbotron there to ensure that everyone would be able to see Ulala. Seems like there were also costumed Merolian characters? We don't have much documentation of this event, but it's cool to know that they were insistent on having Ulala appear in person at these things. Now, while these were both very cool events, when we talk about how the game was marketed in America? Well, that's where things get interesting. Sega showed off the game at E3 2000 by employing a similar strategy to Japan, having a dancer dress up as Ulala, but they took it a step further. This Ulala had a whole team of backup dancers in a several minute long choreographed routine set to various music tracks lifted and or remixed from the game. Sounds like they put on this show multiple times throughout the event as the description for the video we have says it's edited together from two different shows, and one of the comments mentions that it was very popular with attendees. He claims that people ran all the way across the hall to go watch it whenever it would happen, which is an amusing thought. The person playing Ulala this time was named Kelly Preston, who Wikipedia says is an actress and former model. She was in the music video for She Will Be Loved by Maroon 5, if that rings a bell with anyone. I was able to identify her because she and her team of dancers also showed up to an event at Universal City in California where they performed the same routine before an Ulala lookalike contest was held. Twelve girls between the ages of 9 and 21 showed up in homemade costumes for a chance to win the first place prize of $500 and a Sega Dreamcast. They also all got to meet Kelly Preston in character as Ulala. I'm gonna avoid reading the article written about this one because it uses some pretty gross language about these underage girls. I hate to put a damper on the fun video about the dancing game, I, I just thought I would point that out. It's really gross. That's actually just the most unfortunate example of a pattern I noticed with the way the public talked about this game, and to a degree the way it was marketed too. The game itself treats Ulala with respect, but no magazine write-ups really ever did. Actually, while we're on the subject, I really want to talk about the American commercial for this game. Come on, girl, give it up. Check it out, chicks think the rump shakers. Yeah! Hey, get up there! Ooh. She wants her! Hey, baby, come to papa. <laughs> Ooh, heaven. Bad dancing. It's a killer. Space Channel 4, I would say the Dreamcast. Kids. I don't know how to feel about this one. The animation's really nice. It's in the same style as a lot of Dreamcast commercials, where it shows the characters from the game just living, doing stuff. But it's a little weird that they felt compelled to give all the Marolians weird, jarring voices just so that they could uncomfortably hit on Ulala. Part of me thinks that this commercial, on the whole, is sexist, but Ulala also just kills this man in cold blood for harassing her, and she's obviously the heroine, so like maybe it's making a point about how this sort of harassment is really problematic and shouldn't be tolerated. Or maybe I'm thinking too deeply into this commercial for a game from 20 years ago. The marketing for this game is all clearly a product of its time. Which actually segues nicely into the next, more fun and less uncomfortable topic of conversation. Space Channel 5 released in America on June 4th, 2000, and it continued to be promoted throughout the year. Sega's biggest potential tie-in was with MTV. The MTV Video Music Awards, or VMAs for short, were scheduled for Thursday, September 7th of that year. The previous year's VMAs managed to reel in nearly 12 
million viewers, and this year was shaping up to be quite the event in its own right. Some of the biggest acts in mainstream music were scheduled to appear that night. You ready for a time capsule? There were performances from Britney Spears, Rage Against the Machine, Janet Jackson, Christina Aguilera, Blink-182, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Eminem, and more. Half those acts are actually still like pretty popular. That's, that's interesting. Blink, the Chili Peppers, and Eminem are never gonna die, are they? Sega, wanting to push the Dreamcast, and, in particular, the upcoming SegaNet service, one of the first big online services in the history of console gaming, reportedly spent a lot of money on advertising during the event, and IGN reported on that fact in August of that year. However, there's something else of interest in this article that I think is important to note, and that's the fact that it states that the award for best dance video at the event would be presented by... <coughs> Space Channel Saucy, ooh la la. Not only is the only comment about the character sexual, but they didn't even get the game name right. See what I mean? Anyways, why am I even talking about this dumb IGN article? If ooh la la presented the award for best dance video, why don't I just roll the footage? <gasps> is the event itself not online? Do we have a case of lost media on our hands? Well, sort of, but maybe not in the way you might think. See, the 2000 VMAs are on archive.org, and not just like a part of them, quite Quite literally, the whole show, including commercials, is there. And it's a good thing that the commercials are there, because we can see, as per the description, that Sega had a strong advertising presence during the event, and a lot of it was focused on their Sega Net service. But what about Ooh La La? Oh, I think she was in one commercial for like a second. Yeah, see? There she is. <sighs> Okay, so I skimmed through this entire event, and I did eventually find the portion where the award for best dance video was presented. Ooh la la, however, was nowhere to be seen. Said award was presented by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Kid Rock, yes, really, instead. So what happened? Well, my first thought was that IGN somehow got this wrong, but I found an interview with then president of Sega of America, Peter Moore, published by IGN in December of that year, and he specifically states that Ooh la la was at the VMAs. So. So, what happened? It's pretty clear that MTV changed plans, but the question is when and why. Was the segment ever produced? Sounds like it was supposed to be rendered in CG as opposed to featuring someone live as the character, so there's a good chance it was ready to go before being scrapped. This might be something to get to the bottom of someday, but it's a bit beyond the scope of this video, unfortunately. I figured I would bring it up, though, because one, it was supposed to happen, clearly, but two, this isn't the only time that MTV completely screwed Ooh La La over. There were reports in the year 2000 that Ooh La La would appear on MTV in 2001 in some kind of show of her own. In 2003, language used in this GameSpot article was a little more direct, saying that she was, at one point, going to be a virtual newscaster for the program MTV News Now, but the project was scrapped in early development. Since 2006, this footage of the pilot, uploaded by James Montagna, who works at Way Forward, has gone up and down and up and back down again, constantly being struck by Viacom copyright claims. A slideshow version containing the full audio was around in the meantime, so I initially thought that that's all we had, but James has re-uploaded the video to his Twitter and it's currently still up. I'm going to avoid using audio from it in this video, just in case the copyright demons are on my trail, but I will link it in the description. God damn it, this was such a cool idea. She seemed to mostly discuss dance music, which, perfect, no brainer, and she takes on a much more casual tone than the games. It's a shame this never came to fruition. I hope we can find out more about it someday, but it's honestly cool enough to have the pilot. Okay, so in my effort to talk about how Sega pushed the game over in the US, I've talked about a bunch of cases of plans falling through and not actually resulting in any marketing. But there's one more thing that they actually succeeded with. Kind of. Let me explain. Josie and the Pussycats was a movie released in 2001 based off the Archie comics of the same name. Why is this important? Well, believe it or not, Sega actually has a pretty strong presence in terms of product placement throughout the film, to the point where the concert at the climax actually takes place in a fictional building called the Sega Mega Arena. It's quite funny. Anyways, there's a scene earlier in the movie where Space Channel 5 and Crazy Taxi advertising is used prominently in a store. There's even a huge cardboard cutout of Ooh La La. Sega must have paid a lot for this mi Wait, hold up. What's this, what's this part on Wikipedia here? In line with its theme of subliminal advertising, the inordinate degree of product placement in the film constitutes a running gag. None of the advertising was paid promotion by the represented brands. It was inserted voluntarily by the filmmakers. 
Oh, so Sega didn't pay for that? Actually, if you look into the plot of the movie, you'll see that the main villains use subliminal messages to advertise, and so the reasons that the movie contains so many real-world brands is to make the viewer kind of consciously aware of how that technique is used. Kind of makes Sega look like the bad guy, doesn't it? Ooh la la is a symbol of evil corporate power being used to brainwash the masses. Not only that, but similar to the Dreamcast, the movie was a financial failure when it came out, only earning back about $15 million at the box office compared to its $39 million budget. Before it did eventually develop a cult following. So, uh, that's kind of a sour note to end on. Uh, oh, hey, I, I don't know when else I'm ever gonna get to mention this, but check out these Japanese tampon commercials I found. No, it's relevant, I promise. See, they're like a parody of Space Channel 5. They go all in on matching the sort of Dreamcast aesthetic. This lady gets overwhelmed at her weird space job and turns into a video game character. Then they add these weird, like, anime bouncing sound effects when they zoom in on, uh... Anyways, just really bizarre stuff. The character designs in CG actually look good. Like I said, they match the sort of promotional render aesthetic of the Dreamcast era stuff really well. It's just like, why? Space Channel 5 wasn't, like, a particularly well-selling game in Japan, from what I can discern. I, I don't even know when these two ads come from. The earliest YouTube uploads are from 2006, so maybe around then. But that, like, really wouldn't make much sense. That's not long enough for there to be big Dreamcast nostalgia, but also way too late for the Dreamcast to have been relevant. Maybe I'm overthinking it? Maybe they just thought the aesthetic would sell. Maybe this video is getting too long. The Japanese tampon song is stuck in my head now, which means we've got to wrap things up. Now, while this game has not received a modern HD port like its sequel, it did actually see two other releases. One for the PS2 and one for the Game Boy... I'm not talking about that right now. This video is long enough without going into detail on this freak of nature. But I will, however, definitely be talking about the PS2 port, and I'll be doing that right now. The PS2 port of Space Channel 5 is an interesting little oddity in addition to being a genuinely solid way to play the game. In some ways, it has a pretty solid amount of attention put into addressing some of the flaws of the original, but in others, it has an interesting, albeit not terribly intrusive, lack of polish. This version of the game was released in Japan in December 2002, a full 10 months after the game's sequel, Space Channel 5 Part 2, had hit both the Dreamcast and PS2. Europe actually got it in March, only a month after that second game hit PS2 and not Dreamcast, because Sega evidently didn't feel like bleeding money. North America got this port the following year, in November, packaged with the PS2 version of Part 2 as Space Channel 5 Special Edition. A good value for the money, if I do say so myself. Thanks, Age Tech, the American video game publishing company that is best known for bringing Japanese titles to the United States. To be this good takes ages. Haha, <laughs> jokes. Only complaint is that you didn't include the holographic case from the Dreamcast version, you soulless bastards. I can't believe you would ruin the game in this manner, you degenerate lizard people. Right off the bat, the title screen proudly says that this game has been reprogrammed by UGA, the original developers behind the game. While the presentation, and indeed the rest of the game, is mostly unchanged aside from the given things like button names, which are, you know, different, there are a couple minor tweaks that go a long way. For example, a lot of the instances in which the in-game models appear on the wrong pre-rendered background for a frame or two are fixed. Additionally, something about the way the PS2 version registers button presses seems different from the Dreamcast version. It's hard to tell though because I've seen posts online saying it's better, posts online saying it's worse, like they've added a delay, and I'm still not sure if we're all collectively imagining it because I can pretty comfortably play either. If it truly is altered though, and it is on purpose, that reflects a desire on the part of the developers to fix the very picky and sometimes frustrating input registration of the original game, which is immensely appreciated. Or they just messed it up. I don't know. That said, as I mentioned, there are a few oddities. Some aren't really a positive or a negative at all, like the fact that there's a few alternate line reads stuck in there, but others, if I'm not mistaken, seem to reflect that this game was based more on the Japanese version, or perhaps an earlier English version, than the Dreamcast original. I don't have any definitive sources on my theory, but hear me out. The English PS2 version seems to contain more remnants of the Japanese game than the Dreamcast version, most notably the fact that Ulala's Japanese voice remains intact when introducing each report. This is pretty jarring, and I'd initially thought I had the Japanese dub selected before I realized that you actually can't select the Japanese dub and they just 
forgot to change it? Deliberately left it in? I don't know. I only found one reference to this online on the Space Channel 5 wiki, which also has a more comprehensive list of the alternate lines if you're at all interested. The one other kind of major thing I caught that made me think this game could have been based on an earlier English version of the game is Evilla's voice, which in the PS2 version has exactly one slip up. Nearly all of her voice lines are identical between Dreamcast and PS2, but when she introduces herself on PS2, her voice lacks the robot filter. So instead of a menacing robot clone, you get a random lady doing a funny voice. I am ultimate reporter. Overall, despite these flaws, the PS2 version is a great way to experience the game. I might even prefer the feel of the PS2 controller a bit for this game, as the Dreamcast D-pad is a little mushy for faster rhythms. Although they changed the loading screen from saying Mo Loading to just saying Loading, which is a sin because the original is a pun on Merolian. In this TED talk, I will- Both versions have strengths and weaknesses, but the important thing is mostly just that you play this game in some form. Space Channel 5 is a wonderfully quirky and unique rhythm game, and while we don't have concrete sales numbers on it, I personally feel as though it went woefully underappreciated in its time. You'd have to look pretty hard to find another rhythm game with the same personality that this one does, especially if you're looking for a character as iconic as Ooh La La. Sega did a great job with merchandising. There were figures, t-shirts, a lunchbox, a soundtrack CD, a remix CD, a goddamn dress-up magnet set, and other pieces of now very collectible merchandise. Sega wanted Ooh La La to be a celebrity. For this weird little rhythm game about a stylish space reporter from the future defeating aliens with the power of dance to take off and help their equally stylish console last for a few more years. Even the case is stylish. It's holographic. She kick. What other game does that? And well, unfortunately, none of that happened. Both the game and the console enjoy a devoted cult following to this day for the strides that they made forward. It's been more than 20 years since the release of Space Channel 5, and there's still never been another franchise quite like it. I've been Johnny, Reporting from Spaceport 9. Over and out. Space Channel 5! Hello everyone, thank you very much for watching my video about Space Channel 5. I've been working on it since summer of last year. It's a big project, biggest project I've ever partaken in. The research rabbit hole just kept getting deeper and deeper. I hope you guys like the real long form video though. I'm hoping to do more like this in the future since I don't have a consistent schedule anymore. Let me know what you think. And while you're here, I would like to thank the Manic Pineapple for voicing Tetsuya Mizuguchi, Greg Cubed for voicing the Dreamcast Magazine interviewer, and Evan Sakamoto for voicing Jake Kazdahl in this video. All three of them are friends of mine and you should check them all out. The Manic Pineapple does video essays on pretty much whatever he feels like, and they're always really high production, really fun stuff. I think if you enjoy mine, you'll get a kick out of his. I recommend his video on trans validity. He gives some pretty good arguments to shut down some transphobes, if you know any of those. Greg Cubed is a fellow member of the EE podcast with me, and he makes really funny videos also basically about whatever he feels about. He does video games pretty often, but he's also done cartoons, seasons, ALF. Some of my favorite videos of his are the ones where he goes down the 2000s nostalgia rabbit hole. So obviously his video about the 2000s is good for that, but I would also recommend his video about Cheezosaurus Rex, the x craft macaroni and cheese mascot. And Evan Sakamoto is a musician who makes really wonderful music that inspires me in my own creative pursuits pretty often. I'd say if you want to check out his stuff, you should check out the songs Not Alive and Pop. Not Alive's a little bit more dour and personal, and pop is just a fun pop song. A lot of his stuff tends to hit pretty hard for me, and like I said, it's inspired me quite a bit in the past. He has a great sense of melody and a wonderful singing voice. If you're new here and you like Sega, I've done some videos on some Super Monkey Ball games in the past that I recommend checking out. I'll leave a link to that playlist. Since I gotta plug a little bit, just a little bit, you were here for an hour, and I appreciate that, and if you want to keep the train rolling, there you go. Anyways, this is Johnny, signing out. Again, from Spaceport 9. <laughs> Peace.